On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, you get a container ship. I am your host. Nope, it's not Oprah Winfrey. I know, it's hard to tell the two of us apart, but the easiest way to identify one from the other is Oprah is stinking rich and I'm not. I'm your host, Sal McCagalana. Welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping. So, Greg Miller had a story over on Freight Waves that I think needs a little bit of attention because it's touching on a subject vitally important in this supply chain issue, and that is the fact that we are at record levels of container ships being built around the world right now. And what does that mean with the supply chain as we're starting to see cargo coming across the ocean slow down? We're seeing inflation. What are all the big implications for this? So before we delve into this, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come in. All right, let's delve into Greg's story here. So here it is, tidal wave of new container ships, 2023-24, deliveries to break records. Now, I'm a big follower of Greg Miller over at Freight Waves. I think he does a great job. Now, Greg breaks this down in a variety of different ways, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the things he adds here. Obviously, this building of new vessels is going to have a huge implication with what is going on right now in ocean shipping. Now, boom and bust are not new. We've seen this in shipping for a long time, and Greg actually cites that here in the article. But one of the things he talks about here is a huge number of new container ships are going to hit the water at a time of staggering demand, warned Alpha Liner in a report on Tuesday. This is last Tuesday. The market could struggle to absorb all these new ships. The container ship order book now stands at 7.1 million 20-foot equivalent units, according to Alpha Liner shipping analyst Stefan uh, verbeck Mos. I'm trying to hope I said that right. The previous peak was 6.6 6 million TU in 2008. Since then, the global fleet has more than doubled, so the current order book, a record in absolute capacity terms, represents only 30% of existing tonnage, noted Alpha Liner. So we're about to see this record number come in. And so what does this mean as we loom with these ships getting ready to hit the water? So Greg provided this uh, graph from Alpha Liner, which really shows you the number of vessels looming to come on. And you can see here in red the absolute peak that's about to happen here in 2023 and 2024. And he says in the article, the scale of the upcoming deliveries, deliveries is unprecedented. Historical delivery data from Clarkson's shows that the annual fleet growth averaged 970,000 TEUs between 20, uh, 2001 and 2020. Deliveries in 2023 to 2024 will be 2.6 times higher than the average. The previous single year record for annual growth was 1.7 million TEUs in 2014. And meanwhile, this current order book continues to grow. New orders favor dual fuel tonnage that can burn both traditional marine bunker fuel as well as liquefied natural gas or methanol. Alpha Liner shows that 29% on capacity of order is dual fuel. This follows on the heels of Maersk announcing an order on Wednesday for six more new builds that will be able to burn traditional fuel or green methanol. And this has a lot to do with this. And I think that I, and as much as I love Greg and there was a follow on st story here by Rachel Premack that goes in more detail about this is I, I think they miss on a key issue here, and that is the impending issue of IMO 2023. But before we get into that, just a couple of more quotes here from Greg's article, because I think it covers a couple of key things. Maersk CEO Soren Skew addressed this issue during his company's Q2 2022 quarterly call. Quote, what matters in our view in container shipping is not so much how many ships exist, he explained. What matters is how much capacity we deploy in our networks compared to the demand that we have. If we go back to 2020, demand was down sharply by 15% in the second quarter, but freight prices stayed flat because all of the networks adjusted capacity and idle tonnage that was not needed. Certainly going forward, that will be our philosophy. We will provide the capacity our customers need, but we will not sell all the capacity we have unless there is demand for it. Soren is talking about this issue very distinctly here. I'm going to show you this other chart that Greg has in the book or in the article here. And this is chartered tonnage in operation versus tonnage 
on orders. So for example, right here, you can see the, the amount of chartered tonnage currently in operation. Many fleets do not operate vessels that they own. They lease them. They lease them from these NOOs, these non-owner operators, companies like Danos and Custom Air and Atlas and C-SPAN. And a lot of these companies do that. Zim was the most prevalent of that. At one time, Zim had over 100 ships. It was operating and it only owned one. Now that has changed. And what you see here is a lot of these companies are ordering vessels, but much less than they're currently operating. What we're going to start to see is the scrapping of vessels take place. A lot of older tonnage that was not scrapped in 2020, 2021, 2022, which has been sitting there and rem remaining on board, are now going to go and we're going to see them go. And then a lot of these contracts or these these chartered vessels that have been chartered by these, these NOOs, once their leases expire, they're not going to renew them. So we're going to see that those leases are going to go away and instead they're going to be replaced by these new build vessels that are going to be coming on and used exclusively by the companies uh, that are building them. So I want to show you these two stories because I think these two stories go a little bit further deeper in what Greg is talking about. One of them is Greg's story right here. Shipping giant Maersk, significantly less demand but no hard landing. And this is the Maersk CEO and his guidance, which we just heard a second ago, Soren Skoo talking about what's going to happen to his company. And he notes in here, and it comes down here, that, that while demand drops significantly, we have significantly less demand, especially for shipping durable goods. We see demand globally being driven down, not as much by a recession or inflation, but more by the fact that there was over demand during the pandemic. When many of us were not able to travel and spend money on services, we were all upgraded our houses in different ways and we don't need another flat screen or another washing machine or another couch. We clearly see an impact, particularly in Europe and to some degree in the US, of consumers not being able to buy quite the same amount of things as before because of increased pricing. In Europe, consumer confidence is also probably quite negatively influenced by the war at our doorsteps. And basically what you're seeing here is the pandemic is now operating in reverse. Very important to note, while demand is going down, and yes, we are down compared to uh, where we were. We've seen freight rates across the Trans-Pacific now. The rates get lower than they were pre-COVID, a, a thing I, didn't, uh, I, was, I was not sure was going to happen. I didn't think it was going to happen, to tell you the truth. But again, we still see ship backlogs on the East Coast and Gulf Coast ports right now. So we're still seeing products coming across. The question is, have they shifted? And will we see that same slowdown in the East Coast Gulf ports? coast ports after October, because we haven't gotten the September numbers yet. September numbers are going to be up in those ports, be down the West Coast ports, but they're going to be up in the East Coast ports. And now October is in full force, and we're starting to see that slowdown, especially with Golden Week taking place in early October here. So Maersk held second quarterly uh, conference call on August 5th. Since then, we've seen rates drop, and they've dropped obviously more than, than this chart reflects at this time. Uh, it's exactly the opposite of what happened in early 2021. We're not seeing less demand and more supply, which means we'll have a relatively rapid uh, normalization of freight rates. So Maersk is seeing this. goes on here a little bit further. As of August 3rd, Maersk guidance for a full year 2022 earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization of $37 billion, 54% higher than the record $24 billion last year. So they're going to be higher this year than they were last year. And a lot of this has to do with the fact while we're seeing spot rates fall, a lot of Maersk customers have booked into long-term rates. And Maersk is shipping cargo right now at higher rates than you can than than what's offered right now. And so a lot of that cargo coming across is paying a lot more to come across. SKU reaffirmed his earnings and demand guidance on Thursday despite the sharp fall in spot rates over the past eight weeks. Reuters correspondent asked uh, Skew whether, given the worsening economic outlook, there would be more of a hard landing than a normalization. And his response, I don't see a hard landing for Maersk. And I think that's a really important issue here. He is not seeing that Maersk is going to suffer badly. So if you come back to this then for a second, let's talk about this for just a second, and then we'll wrap this up. So we've seen falling freight rates, freight rates just off a cliff. Uh, and now below pre-COVID rates on the Trans-Pacific. Still high on the Transatlantic, but low on the Trans-Pacific. 
we've seen an increase, uh, a decrease in demand for goods, yet we still have ship lines off Savannah, off New York, New Jersey, off Houston. We're seeing this happen all over the place. And we're seeing these record number of container ships coming online, which would indicate to everybody there's going to be huge oversupply of vessels. And this is what everybody's talking about. There's going to be huge oversupply of container ships. There's going to be more container ships than ever before. We're going to be in the same position we were post-2008 when the companies were on a spending spree ordering these new big container ships. And what we're going to see is freight rates crash across the board. But everybody's forgetting one key thing or two key things. Number one, you're going to start seeing ships scrapped, laid up quickly here because nothing has been laid up or scrapped for three years. That's going to happen all across the board. But the other thing we're meeting, we're missing here is the impact of IMO 2023, which is about to take place. And when IMO 2023 hits, you're going to see a big change. So what is IMO 2023? Funny you should ask. So this is a story that was in uh, uh, Offshore Energy where they interviewed uh, Soren Skew of Maersk Lines. Mayor CEO, we will need 5 to 15% more capacity to meet IMO 2023. Well, wait a minute, why would you need more capacity to meet your requirements? And it goes in here. Uh, as of 2023, the shipping industry will need to meet a new round of vessel efficiency and carbon intensity regulations applying to existing ships. In practice, this means ships would have to meet specific energy efficient existing ship index, the EEXI, and have an advanced ship energy efficiency management plan, the SEMP. And that lays out the vessel's energy efficiency improvement steps and determines carbon intensity indicators, the CII. These regulations aim to cut carbon intensity of all ships by 40% by 2030 when compared to 2008 values. We're looking, now again, IMO 2020 cuts sulfur. What we're looking at here now is carbon, and IMO 2050 aims to cut down to 20, uh, 50% of 2008 limits. But IMO 2030, which is going to take place in graduated steps here, is accelerating this quite a bit. And what he says here, this is relatively new legislation. This is from SKU. This is relatively new legislation. We are still trying to figure out what the impact will be on supply. There are different ways of improving the energy rating of old ships. You can use biofuel or slow down the speed. There are two obvious ways of moving the energy rating from a D to a C. At this point, we only have some high-level numbers for our fleet. It looks like in order to comply, we will need somewhere between 5 and 15% more capacity up towards 2030 if the way we comply is by lowering the speed. This is quite a significant impact if compliance is based on slowing down the speed, which is most likely option given the shortage of biofuels and their price. Of course, this is still outstanding. Maersk wants to use biofuels. They want to use this green methanol. But the problem is getting it. And one of the things that we've seen is with fuel prices spiking through the roof right now, even very low sulfur fuel oil is extremely expensive. And so a lot of ships are burning the older high sulfur fuel, fuel oil, but they have been fitted with scrubbers on their engines to be able to burn the, 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 the higher sulfur fuel, but cheaper fuel. And so companies are really looking for mixes of ships What's going to be the best vessel to put on routes? And what you actually may see is shipping companies laying up some ships and putting ships on different routes because of their energy efficiency. Going on here, uh, what we understand is that it would really start being enforced in 2024 and 2025. Therefore, the short-term impact may be very limited, but in the longer term, it will be quite significant. So when this comes into effect in 2023, and here's a kind of a, a little cheat sheet that I found that really kind of helps explain. And of course, I'll have it in the show notes so you can take a look at it here. It really breaks it down. So when you talk about the EEXI, you're talking about all vessels are have to have this figure calculated, likely uh, more impractical for older vessels. The ve older vessels would not be able to make these, these, uh, these numbers and therefore would have to be laid up. Likely more impactful for re regional trade that features smaller feeder vessels rather than deep sea trades. The energy plan, which is going to be something that has to be developed for all vessels. But really, when you get into the CII, this carbon intensity indicator, this is a real big thing. All vessels must have a rating uh, where A is the best and E is the worst. All ships rated D or E for three consecutive years must submit a corrective action plan to show how the required index 
may be achieved. There are many things a ship can do to improve its rating through various measures on existing capital. Many fishing improvements and emissions, reducing path waves are being executed by carriers such as hull cleaning to reduce drag, steam speed adjustment, slow steaming, routing optimization, and fuel switching. These regulatory requirements are expected to enter in force on November 1st, 2022. If that re happens, the requirements will come into effect on January 1st, 2023. That means the first annual meeting reports will be completed in 2023 with the first uh, ratings given in 2024. Everybody's missing this right now. We're seeing these massive number of container ships coming on, and all we're looking at is supply and demand. We're failing to look at the energy issue, which is so important right now. A lot of the money that went into the hands of the container companies is being used to figure out how they best can conform to these new requirements being set out by the IMO and local and regional uh, countries that are putting a lot of demands on them for slow, slowing vessels down and being more green and efficient. You have countries and, and ports talking about green corridors and ways to move cargo more efficiently. Newer vessels, this is why Maersk has not built new ships in years. It's because they knew this was coming along. And what they're talking about now is green methanol. This is something that can be produced and put at hand. LNG, which is another type of fuel that's out there, it's really difficult to find places to refuel by LNG. You need LNG bunkering facilities. You need, it's not just hooking up to a natural gas. You've got to liquefy it. you got to store it on the vessel, which means keeping it at negative 260 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. There's a lot of logistics and burden in shifting over fuels of these ships. And understanding right now we're in the intermediate phase. We are nowhere near to what the final fuel is going to be that's going to meet IMO 2050. But with ships that have 20, 30 year life cycles in 2022, you're building ships right now that are in that intermediate stage. They're going to have to be probably short leg ships or suitable for conversion so that they can keep operating in the future. Older vessels are going to be transferred laid up because they're just not going to be economical anymore. And I think this is a big issue that we're missing when 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 Soren Skew comes out and says, I'm going to need five to 15 percent more capacity because I got a slow speed. I got to slow my vessels down until my new technology comes online to meet this. And then I got to bleed off this tonnage. That is an important issue we need to pay attention to. So, yes, we're going to have excess capacity out there in these container lines, but it doesn't mean we're going to see the rates come crashing down like we did post 2008 2015 time period when there was a massive rate war out there that led to the collapse of Hanjin Marine for example. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, if you can, support the page. How can you support the page? Well, I'm not Oprah Winfrey, so I can use some support. You can do it one of two ways. One, you can hit that super thanks button below, allows you to contribute directly to the page, or you can hit the Patreon link. You'll see it come up at the end of the video or down in the show notes and become a patron of the page. You can offer support either monthly or yearly. Whatever you do is much appreciated. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off.